Happy Memorial Day, everybody. Uh, I hope you're getting out, or I guess now got outside this weekend despite the spotty weather. Hope you took a, a bit of a rest before your last week of this very odd school year. And I also hope you took at least a few moments to actually consider what it, to actually consider what Memorial Day is actually supposed to be about. It's a chance to remember and reflect on the people who gave their lives uh, in service of our country, and in fact, in service of us, given the fact that we are a democracy and this is a nation of the people, by the people, for the people. Uh, when people give their lives in their service, they really are giving it to us on a very personal level. Uh, over the weekend, uh, you'll probably see a lot of programming on different TV networks um, related to Memorial Day. Uh, I know that the History Channel is running a series on Ulysses S. Grant. I know they're running a Vietnam and HD series, which is really good if you ever get a chance to take a look at it. Uh, most Memorial Days, I see that they run uh, HBO's miniseries Band of Brothers. Again, excellent. And I'm sure at some point, some network is going to be running Save It Private Ryan. Um, if you've never seen it, it typically comes in right at the very top of the list anymore of kind of the great war movies. And what most people talk about with Saving Private Ryan is the first 30 minutes, which depicts attempts by Allied forces, American forces, to land on the beaches of Normandy in northern France on D-Day in 1944. Hmm. It really is an incredible piece of work from a cinematic perspective. Um, a lot of war movies up until this point in time, there was a neatness and an order to it. You knew where the hero was, how they fit into the big picture, but the way that the D-Day um, landing was filmed, it was very chaotic. It was filmed with lots of cameras going in and out of focus, losing track of what was going on and where it was going on. The sounds were coming from all over, and the sounds would occasionally get muffled. And it really was designed to kind of create this chaotic kind of sense of not exactly sure what's going on here. And... Um, ultimately, they do take the beaches, and again, it really is an incredible, um, although also incredibly graphic and violent, um, 30 minutes. And for a lot of people, that 30 minutes is kind of their memory of Saving Private Ryan. But this is a nearly three-hour movie. And so what the actual story gets into, it's following attempts by <clears throat> a Captain John Miller, who has been tasked with finding a single United States private, Private James Ryan, who was dropped in um, the day prior to D-Day, to, to extricate him. Um, in the story's plotline, uh, Private Ryan had several other brothers who were already killed in different, in different parts of World War II, and the United States Army wanted to kind of save Private Ryan's mother from ha losing her last, and, last remaining son. So Captain John Miller, that's the Tom Hanks character, <clears throat> he gathers up a small squad of soldiers to go through Nazi-occupied France to locate this needle in a haystack. I mean, there are lots of John Ryans. And again, there's a reason why the filmmakers chose John Ryan or James Ryan as the name. Very common name um, that they would find really all over the United States. Now, the squad, and you see them right above my head there, as they travel through Nazi-occupied France, a couple of things are taking place. One is they're going from town to town looking for Private Ryan. Uh, they're encountering resistance from Nazi forces. And over the course of their travels, they're periodically losing one member after another. The second thing that's going on during this time is there's this ongoing debate over whether or not this is a worthy mission. Um, the character that you see in the front of the line there He's the one more than anybody who's openly questioning whether it makes sense to put some people's lives on the line just to save another person. And in this case, seven or eight members. Um, and this is this running kind of commentary and debate going on through kind of the action sequences of the film. Uh, the captain, again, the Tom Hanks character in this case, when directly asked whether or not he thinks it's worth it, his statement is, if finding Private Ryan, if saving Private Ryan is something that gets him closer to home, so be it. But he doesn't personally care about James Ryan. He doesn't know him. He doesn't really matter to him as a person. Now, ultimately, they do find Private Ryan. But before they leave, Private Ryan has decided, I'll let you take me out, but not before I help my squad with this one mission to 
and defend this one French town. He wasn't going to abandon his band of brothers. So Tom Hanks' character and the other remaining, they're kind of forced to make the choice of... They're forced to make the choice of, we're not going to leave, we're going to stay here and help him before we complete our mission. Now, during the battle, um, almost all of the squad is killed, um, except for the character in front there. And Captain John Miller, Tom Hanks' character, is mortally wounded. What I would like you to do now is going to pause this lecture, and there are two clips from the movie that are posted in Google Classroom. I would like you to take a look at the first one. It's titled The Death of Captain John Miller. It's a, a couple of minutes long, and it shows the reaction of Private Ryan um, to the death of the person who willingly gave his life or put his life on the line in order to save him. I'm going to pause this video so you can switch over. So in that section of Saving Private Ryan, as it was very, as it became clear that Captain Miller was breathing his last breaths essentially, he pulled in James Ryan and whispered, earn this. Earn this. In other words, the members of my squad may have had something right about whether or not this was a worthy mission. That a number of Americans gave their lives to protect one random person who they've never even met, who they never otherwise would have ever come to know. Suggesting that, all right, if we've sacrificed ourselves for you, then you have to do something with this. It's not just enough for us anymore to say, well, I guess we did our mission, but rather make sure that you actually earn what we have sacrificed for. I'm going to, again, direct you to the second clip now um, from Saving Private Ryan, and it's actually just a continuation of the previous scene. And it shows Private Ryan now as an elderly person visiting uh, Captain John Miller's tomb at Arlington National Cemetery. And I'd like you to think about what the discussion is between Private Ryan, elderly now elderly Private Ryan, and his wife. I'm going to pause the video one more time. So the movie definitely focuses on this question of, has Private Ryan earned the death of these other men? Um, and he asks his spouse again, tell me I'm a good man. And she's kind of confused, and she's definitely making sense out of something has gone on here. She knows somebody has sacrificed for him. But I don't think the movie is really asking us to think about saving Private Ryan. I think the film is asking us to consider us. Have we, in a sense, earned what the people who fought and died for in World War II, and for that matter, other wars, have we earned what they fought for? So to set this up a little bit, um, we had roughly 16 million Americans who served in the armed services during World War II. Um, nearly 300,000, I think the number is like 291,000 deaths during the couple of years that the United States was directly involved in World War II. We defeated Nazi Germany. We defeated Imperial Japan in 1945. But to go to Captain Miller's statement of earning this, that means we have to have some sense of what it is that we were fighting for. Sorry about that. Um, to go back several months, in the Atlantic Charter in 1941, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, along with Winston Churchill, they said what they think this war is about. Obviously, yes, winning, but winning for what? And one of the grand purposes was to continue to establish the idea that people should have a voice in their own governments fighting for democracy. We weren't just fighting Germany, we were fighting Nazi Germany. We weren't just fighting Japan, it was Imperial Japan. So at the conclusion of the war, it was very clear that England was fading into the background as a global power. And the United States in some ways kind of stood somewhat, or we felt very alone as kind of this champion of democracy. So I'd also like you to consider this idea of earn it. The United States was just as militarily successful in World War I as World War II, but World War I doesn't hold, seem to hold the same place in the American imagination. 
And part of that is how Americans immediately after World War I began to think about and interpret what World War I was. The United States fought, Americans died, and the United States won the war. But within a decade after the war, there was a growing sense amongst Americans that it had not been worth it, that we had not fundamentally improved the world by our entry into the war. We retreated from this kind of international stage, and there was a sense, even into the 1930s, that we really probably should have stayed out. This was certainly part of the reason why, as World War II was preparing to break out in Europe, the United States, we, we stayed out. In a sense, we didn't think that people's sacrifice in 1917 and 1918 had been worth it. So the question, save it, the question that Saving Private Ryan really is asking is, has the United States earned the death and the sacrifice of the people who put their lives on the line for us? And that brings us to your final essay prompt. And you see it up in the top left there. Um, the question is, had the United States fulfilled what World War II was supposed to have been fought for, primarily for the right of people to have a voice in their own forms of government, both inside the United States and and around the world by 1988, since that's really as far as we got with our shortened school year. Had we earned it in a very simple way? Um, this is the basis of what your essay is going to be. Now, within your essay, there's a second part, and that is once you have arrived at your response, your conclusion, I'm asking you to do a little bit of self-analysis and self-interpretation. And... I'm going to ask you to place your own thesis, your own thinking, into one of the schools of American historiographical thought. Um, there's a, uh, the document that we've seen before is posted in Google Classroom, um, and I'd like you to worry about that last, because I don't think you can really do that part until you first think of what do you think the answer really is? How or had the United States, in a sense, earned it? Had we made use of the sacrifices of our grandparents. So what your task really is prior to tomorrow. Oops. I don't know why that's on there. So your job before tomorrow is to start brainstorming really through chapters 26 to 30 um, ideas, movements, information that are going to, I swear every time that that freezes up, uh, yeah, it's with, with my eyes closed. Go figure. So to go back, um, before tomorrow's session is to start brainstorming ideas, events, movements that you think are going to help you to best answer that question of had the United States fulfilled the goals of World War II. What I would like you to do is, uh, before we begin class, our sessions on Wednesday, to have a working idea for a thesis, because you're going to be working with other people in the class at looking at your thesis, giving some ideas for defense, and getting some input from other members of your class into, um, have you thought about this? Why are you thinking this way? And we'll also do a little bit of work with those schools of American historiographical thought. Um, again, I'd like you to do that, that part last, not worry about that yet. Um, because what I don't want you to do is to decide, well, here's how I think, and then on the basis of that, come up with a thesis. Um, historians, at least good historians, don't do that. What they do is they look at the evidence. They make their best reasoned judgment based upon their best understanding of the evidence before them. It's other historians who tend to put them into schools of American historiographical thought. So with that, I'm going to turn you loose to um, start brainstorming, um, thinking through major eras. And again, this is posted in Google Classroom um, since uh, 1945, essentially. And we will see you tomorrow.